welcome to the conclusion of our two-part interview with Angels and Airways engineer, producer, and mixer Aaron Rubin. My name is Adam Barnard, and today I am proud to present the second part of an interview we conducted with Aaron circa October 2019. Um, the interview was originally scheduled to be 30 or 40 minutes, but something sparked and we took about an hour and 20 minutes <laughs> to get through the interview on the phone, so we found it prudent to dissect the interview into two parts, and so the second part will pick up right where we left off and dive more into the Dreamwalker, the EPs, and what's to come for Angels and Airwaves. So Aaron, it feels like a lot of a lot of like the Dreamwalker and, and even the EPs are, like you said, taking the sound and really pushing it in a new direction, keeping the roots and just the tree that grows out of it is completely diversified because it's not just going to an, an old bag of tricks. Uh, I'm just wondering specifically with some of the albums like the say Dreamwalker and the Of Nightmares and Chasing Shadows EP, how did you go about finding the sound for those records? Or is it something you guys talk about a lot? Is it something that gets delegated to you to kind of develop through your skill set? Because like I, definitely with Dreamwalker, you have a very lo-fi, grungy type sound to it, sonics to it. Even if the songs are very soaring, there's a grounded and gritty uh, feeling. And then Of Nightmares, you know, took some of the demos from the Dreamwalker's demo album, um, but put it on a separate EP that has its own vibe. And then you have Chasing Shadows, which I personally did not expect. It was so completely different than any precedent you had worked on. And that's when I realized you guys, like every EP or every album, we're going to work on changing things up and changing up your songwriting. But how do you go about finding the sonic identity of a specific release that you work on when you're trying out so many sounds? I don't think it's anything that's premeditated. Jimmy Page once said that an album is a snapshot of where the band is at that moment in time. And... If you think about an album in that context of, you know, I'm taking a picture of myself today. This is just what I was into, you know, on this day. Whereas three years ago, you know, you may look different. You're wearing different style clothes. You might have a different hairstyle. It just was what it was then and there. As far as like when albums go, we'll start working on a project and it won't ever really start with all right, here's what we're going to do. You know, it's like we're going to work on an EP. We'll put some ideas down, see where it kind of goes. And at that point, you know, Tom's either really into a band or I just got a new plug-in or it could be a multitude of different things of what's going on. You know, what's what's kind of great about the EPs that we had done, like Of Nightmares and Chasing Shadows, is that you're not held to a certain vibe or sound because it's literally four songs or five songs or whatever it may be. It's just kind of like, let's just put a few songs out and see what happens. You know, you don't really have anything bigger Set Now, Tom has this thing about, you know, coupling his, you know, Chasing Shadows was to be coupled with the book Chasing Shadows. Yeah. Um, I think lyrically he may have connected the dots more with um, his books as opposed to the sounds. But song-wise, we were just sitting there writing stuff. Or, you know, we'd start with, like, a groove, you know, and then build upon that thing and then kind of say oh it'd be cool if we kind of went into this like failure type drone uh the song what was the song that i think it was artillery you know kind of two very mismatched pieces of music that kind of we thought hey it would be interesting to do this like completely nice thing for the for the verses and then get into this like really like out you know out of nowhere chorus so it wasn't necessarily an exercise on making something um, awesome. I was like, let's experiment. And if, hey, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you know, and you do something else. But at least we we chased, you know, an idea <laughs> and, you know, we're there. So I think that's kind of like where we were at. Um, and mind you, we never have any sort of titles or anything. We didn't even know that the Dreamwalker was going to become the Dreamwalker or be called the Dreamwalker when the album was being written. There wasn't any sort of thing. It wasn't until the Poet Anderson stuff started happening that Tom wanted to kind of like cross-market 
the music with the um, with the animation and the whole world of Poet Anderson. And, you know, th- those are discussions that I have with Tom, too. And, you know, frankly, I kind of always say, let the music live on its own because you don't want to put a face to your music that, A, didn't have anything to do with the music, and then, B, if people hate Poet Anderson and they're going to be thinking about Poet Anderson when they're listening to Tunnels or any one of these other songs that they might not like really even go well together or mesh, um, then you can put a bad taste in somebody's mouth for the music just through a visual. And to me, it was like, no, I, you know, and that's kind of where my head was at. And I've had those conversations with him. And I think little by little, he's kind of started like, all right, yeah, that's starting to make sense. I'm like, that's not to say that we can't, you know, Elon Tom and I scored that um, the that poet Anderson short, and you know there's some you know orchestral stuff in there, and then there's you know some bits and bobs that were written, you know just specifically for twenty thirty seconds, that was more either sound design or something, and then yeah there were parts of songs from the Dreamwalker that were put in there instrumentally, and worked great you know it's like perfect this works um and i always say inject the music into the short but don't don't (laughs) inject the short into the music kind of thing (laughs) you know what i mean it's like how many how many movies are out there where you know they're just soundtracked by songs that are popular and whether they use those songs as because they really work with the scene or because they paint a picture of the setting then that's a different thing and I'm like, we can definitely use Angel's music to soundtrack the other stuff, but let's not try to pepper in the visuals into, you know, whatever. Now, if you want to have, you know, if Angel's had like this big video screen and, you know, they're playing a song and Poet Anderson literally runs across the screen, like making a little cameo, then that's like a cool little Easter eggs for those fans who enjoy both. And his whole thing was never to have, you know, everything be an Angels and Airways fan base. His whole thing was, you know, I have my fan base and hopefully they're loyal to me and what I do and what my vision is for the band. But he also wanted to make Poet Anderson stand on its own two legs in the same way that it's, that he's made Unidentified stand on his own two legs. And you don't really hear much about Angels and Airwaves in that show or anything like that because it's a topic all of its own and he's brought fans over to angels and airwaves from that show and he's also brought angels and airwaves fans to that show so it's kind of like this cool thing but like every his whole intention was to have each of these properties stand on their own two legs um so to answer your question no there's never any real plans we didn't have a plan for how this album goes but you write five songs and you're like all right, there is a theme recurring here. And, you know, right now with, you know, Kiss and Tell and Rebel Girl, they're completely different songs, but sonically there are these things that run through both songs that put them together. And that's really cool, especially if they're different songs. One's more poppy, the other one's more of a driving anthemic, you know, song, and that's that. So... My whole thing is just to be able to take a picture of the band at that point in time. This is what we're into. This is what we're doing. These are the songs we're writing. Sometimes you're going to nail it. Sometimes you're not going to nail it. Wow. Yeah. So so even even with like the EPs like of Nightmares and Chasing Shadows, or like Chasing Shadows specifically, I always thought it had like a very metallic industrial, just some of the echoes you used. It sounded very mechanical. And I always thought that was intentional, but I guess it might have just been where you guys' head was at in terms of producing and the kinds of sounds that were pleasing to you at the time. So Chasing Shadows was a very weird um, thing because this is something that put Elon was out with Nine Inch Nails while we were recording that, and what ended up happening is that it was just literally me and Tom in the studio. So because we didn't have Elon, we were programming a bunch of stuff, 
and we were using a lot of different sounds within the box and and whatnot. And then Elon had a day off and he cut drums for whatever parts that we had that were, you know, had live drums. And when he, when we, you know, it's kind of like he was in the mix the whole time as far as what was happening. So he'd be getting all the roughs while he was on tour and whatnot. And he was just kind of like, that's just cool. Keep going with it. Like, it got to a point though, like at rehearsals where, <laughs> where Tom was showing him a song from Of Nightmares and he's like, I played drums on that? Like, he just completely did not remember the song, like, or anything. And I do attribute that to the fact that at any given time, he's got to have like a hundred songs, like perfectly. It's like a, a whirlwind. It's just like, what, what's going on? Like Overload, he thought that Brooks played that because it was <laughs> kind of during that time that we were doing Tom's solo record and then we did Chasing Shadows and it's like, Brooks played on this, right? I'm like, no, that's you. He's like, I don't remember playing the song ever. And I'm like, wow, well, that was, you came in and you played three songs and that was one of the songs, you know? And it's like crazy. Yeah. Uh, to complicate things, it's funny. I remember when the solo record came out before you told everyone on Instagram that uh, that Brooks has played. I think a lot of people thought it was a lawn because their drumming styles does have some overlap. So I totally understand where that came from. Yeah. Well, yeah, Elon was out on the road, and it was a really, it was really kind of weird time when that whole thing happened, because it was kind of like when you know Mark and Travis kind of like out of nowhere was like Tom quit the band. He's like, "What? <laughs> I did?" Yeah. And then you know there was that whole thing in the press, and it was just kind of like the wrong way to go about things, and. Oddly enough, that was something that really put a damper on the Dreamwalker because at that point, Tom was just like, you know, this was the month after the Dreamwalker came out, right? Yeah, the Dreamwalker pretty came much. Out December 2014, the Blink split was 20, or like January 2015, uh, before you did any of these EPs, I think. Yeah. And it was just kind of like, I'm going to put out the solo record. And it's like, but what about this? He's just like, well, I, you know, I got to get this out and kind of just. Yeah be done with these songs and whatever it was. And so Elon was out on, I think he was out on tour. I feel like with the solo record though, I, it seemed like you guys were just having a lot of fun. Like the record itself is, is, you know, it's not super polished as some of the other stuff you'd worked on, but there's such energy. And I mean, you know, there are some very funny songs on there, like the final track, Golden Showers and the Golden State. And it seemed like there was just, or Endless Summer, which is a very, very happy summer song to me. It seemed like there was just a lot of energy and inspiration, even if that was just, you know, meant to close a chapter. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of those songs were songs that we had, you know, that had come up, like if Tom was going to be writing something, because I, I actually did all of Tom, all the engineering on Tom's side of things for um, that the Blinky P, the... Dogs Eating Dogs? Yeah. Oh, so you did all the vocal engineering, guitar engineering, that kind of stuff? Yeah, everything that was like Tom's parts, synths, oh, wow. guitars, or vocals, I would then send to... Um, to Chris Holmes, who was doing Travis and Tom, of which, oddly enough, um, fast forward a few years, and Chris Holmes is part of the Nine Inch Nails crew and, you know, kind of runs playback and whatnot, and it's just kind of like, okay, so we're all, this all goes full circle, and is yeah, him and Elon play tennis uh, when um, when they're out on the road with Nine Inch Nails, <laughs> so, so that's fun. Um, but um, But, yeah, so throughout that time, you know, Tom will get a phone call from even when we're doing the Dreamwalker and stuff, and it'd be, you know, Mark and Tom saying, hey, let's put some demos together for some stuff. And we'd end up doing, like, Blink-type demos. And at that point, Tom, you know, I was very cognizant to tell Tom, like, you know, with Neighborhoods and Dogs Eating Dogs, there was angels and airwaves bleeding into Blink World. And I'm like, you have the opportunity to do stuff that you got sick of doing um, in Blink. To do that, bring that back. And, you know, now that you've kind of gone off and we're experimental with like the self-titled record and whatnot. And even with all the Angel stuff, like he's been, I'm like, just kind of go back to your roots. And he started writing all these like super, you know, 
whether they were fast or funny or just basic, super basic blink type songs. We had a lot of those things as demos. Now, none of those things really came to fruition with Blink because it they'd start up and then there'd be a breakdown and whatnot. So we had most of those songs done. I think you may have written maybe two songs, two or three songs on top of that that ended up going on that record. And a lot of those were just like kind of like, all right, let's really, you know, the golden showers and the golden state. Like, just <laughs> re- let's really just take it over the top and write a song like that and be like okay cool and it was like all right done but yeah as most of those things were demos like there it wasn't about polishing stuff yeah did you retrack everything of the demos you had because i've i've heard conflicting information that either like you just put a polish on the demos you actually like redid the guitars and did them engineered them more properly and less on the go because i know you did you know acoustic drums it wasn't in the box it wasn't programmed drums for the record either no no they, they so, so so we recorded the acoustic drums and that was already to the demos that were there. Um, if we had to like retract something, we did. If I can get away with just kind of keeping it demos, then I, we left it demos. But I mean, sometimes, especially the way Tom works, he'll be like, oh, it'd be so cool if we added this synth sound now. That's something that we do. Or that riff was played absolutely terribly. Let me retrack it and do it. Um, but I tried, I mean, I would say... of it is just, you know, actual demos. Wow. It's a great record, too. Songs like Animals are are so much more sophisticated than demos. Whatever you did, you seemed... I guess maybe you do very detailed demos from the start because songs like that feel like they could fit on any other record. Well, Animals, Animals was one that was recorded for that record. And that was just something where it was just like... He may have had a riff and he came in one day. He's like, dude, let's just do something new and see what happens and you know there was a whole we originally did the whole thing with a loop just a old drum loop of a you know I had like a whole like library of drum loops from records and whatnot there's a lot of these old you know drummers that you know in in the 60s and 70s that you know you'd be able to pull out these like little break um, drum breaks and whatnot and I have those and we kind of wrote the whole thing to that. And he had the guitars over it. And then bass-wise, I was like, let me try something. And I, you know, went and put the bass line down. He's like, dude, that's awesome. He's like, let's just leave that. And then then Brooks came in, and I think he retracked. And so it wouldn't just be the same loop over and over and over and over. I'm not sure if I left the loop in there. I do keep detail notes within my sessions. And if I ever have to do like, uh, you know, it'll be like, oh, we use this guitar through this amp, through this mic pre, through that compressor, this EQ. But I, I keep that just in case we ever have to retract something or whatnot. Or in case the day that the album is so big and so amazing and people actually care. Well, you get a lot of, you get a lot of questions on Instagram I mean, definitely you've been very generous interacting with fans there and you've answered a lot of my questions sometimes on there too. So I feel like those notes do get used sometimes. Well, in in the case of Angels and Airwaves, it's like we've just got the system down that the stuff that I'm using is just like, I'm using, you know, I'm using the same vocal chain for Tom on the Dreamwalk from the Dreamwalker to this day. And the only time that we've used different mic or vocal chain or anything like that was for um a few songs on um on the acoustic um the we don't need to whisper and that's the first and then i was just like god i like this mic on your voice so much more tom (laughs) and it's kind of like the other mic is like i don't know it's it's kind of a nostalgia thing i don't know if it's just because he's so used to singing into that mic or it reminds him of you know jerry finn or yeah. whatever i don't know what it is but i was just like yeah it's definitely the sound of tom that we've all learned to love 
I feel like it's definitely a balance of, you know, nostalgia or, or precedent or history and then innovation as well, which I feel like has defined a lot of the work. Uh, I want to just wrap up with the new stuff, actually, with Rebel Girl and Kiss and Tell. And I know one of the themes we've touched on in this interview is that, you know, each album is a snapshot of, of a band at a certain time, you know, whether it's any of the EPs or the albums you've worked on. Where do you think the band is at now? Are you able to say, you know, you're somewhere in the middle of doing the record where you feel like the energy is or, or where is the band at this moment in time as they're finishing this next full length album? Well, this is where it's going to get interesting because we started working on this record probably November of last year on and off. And as with Tom, there's all these things that kind of get in our way and become these pressing things and we kind of sit there and prioritize certain things. So when we started the record, um, two songs that we started with were Kiss and Tell and Rebel Girl. Those were like two songs that were like the first two ideas and whatnot. And then what ended up happening was we needed to start scoring for Unidentified. What ended, what ended up happening was that we got through about one episode and Tom was just like, we got to finish these songs. Like, I can't do, we can't, we can't be spending all this time like scoring every episode. It's going to be like a full-time crazy job and we have all these other things that we have to do. Let's just leave them with this hour's worth of music and, you know, they can sprinkle it in with what they want or with what, what they and use what they want and then if they want something completely different they can you know get, put other music behind it or whatever but that was something that i thought was super fun to do like when we were doing it um totally different than anything you've done before right with with angels yeah i mean yes and no cuz it was like okay how do we score this thing so that it benefits the um it benefits the you know, how the show kind of moves from part to part and builds tension or, you know, whatever whatever emotion you're trying to put into what's being told, whether it's like the scene where the they're chasing, being chased by a UFO or, you know, they're spotting this thing and it's got to be more like adventurous and like upbeat, whether or whether it's something like we're going into like Lou telling his backstory, you know, it's got to be a little bit more light and whatever so it was cool to be able to kind of do that and then you know the other thing that I wanted to do was inject Tom thematically into that thing so yeah we did a few things that had like guitar riffs that were very Tom or things that were kind of like Angels and Airwaves staples within that and you know whether it be melodically chord progression wise or Whatever we wanted to put that in there. So back to the original thing, we get, we get these two songs done. We say, okay, let's go in and record drums for three songs, which we ended up doing. We finish Rebel Girl. Rebel Girl comes out. Then we go and we finish Kiss and Tell, and um, we have another song that's complete. That's kind of like in the back pocket, but that was like the first song that was complete. And I think where we went with um, Kiss and Tell and Rebel Girl, I think, is leagues away from where this first song was at. You know, that song will either get put in the trash bin or we'll rework it and try to bring it to where the other two songs are. Um, But in the meantime... It'll be like, oh, we got to get Rebel Girl done. And Tom will come in and be like, yeah, but I have this idea for another song. Let's just <laughs> do that. And, you know, and then I have to go to management and be like, oh, you didn't want to finish Rebel Girl today. So we did this. And it's like, all right, well, you got one more day to finish <laughs> Rebel Girl. But we have all these like little ideas. What are they? Ideas right now. You know, you don't know where it's going to go, where it's going to end up. Now, another thing that gets thrown into to this loop that uh, it's going to be very interesting for me. We're supposed to start working next week. Um, is that they did this whole tour and Tom being back on stage after, you know, seven years Yeah, is one of those things where it's like, we got so used to just writing songs in the studio and not caring, you know, 
how it would translate live, which, by the way, the songs did translate live and they were great. But it wasn't that thing where it's like, oh, man, I really want something upbeat that, you know, we're going to be able to interact with the crowd this way or that way or all of that stuff. So now it's going to be interesting to see if any of that has an, any influence on the ideas that we did pre-tour. In t- but in terms of just like sonics or genre, or I know Tom said he wanted to write the soaring classical angels and airwaves sounds with, you know, mix that with the Dreamwalker. He also said, I think in some interviews, like the minute you get in the studio, it changes. So just like genre wise or tone wise, where do you think the record is at or where are you interested in heading? Like you guys being angels and airwaves. I, I think as of right now, you're going to have a lot of classic uh, angels and airwaves melodies themes and whatnot but you're also going to be hearing a lot of post-punk or new wave type stuff that's been part of like the fabric of who tom is musically and now feels that hey i can do it i have the people behind me that can a get the sounds right get the parts right you know i think he's very aware of that and rejuvenated because he may have not been able to do that when they were recording Love or I Empire or whatever. And it was like, sure. they were going to wind up with a very different result. So they may have tried to do that and ended up somewhere completely different. But, you know, a lot of it is Tom listening to music, saying, hey, I love this. I'd like to have something like this be part of our arsenal. He always mentions, you know, Band of Horses, like vocally with all the reverbs and in the national and stuff like that, where it's like you think... Tom thinking about those bands and it's like yeah Sigur Ross is something that he listens to like all the time so he likes to like you know take little bits and bobs of like what he thinks are cool things and how he can then blend it into what he does so I don't know where it's gonna go I know that kind of the mandate as of right now between what he said in interviews and you know because after a certain point it's like you get to you know Monday morning quarterback your your music and say, oh, th- these are the running themes. These are sonically what makes them kind of cohesive. And turns out this is that snapshot. And I'm now, I now get to tell you the snapshot after looking at it, you know, and telling you, telling you what's there. But I would, I would assume that there's still going to be some experimenting. Um, there, you know, you might hear something that you've never heard from Angels and Airwaves and there will be stuff that you've that you've heard from Angels and Airwaves kind of just hopefully done in a little bit of a different way and there's always all these I like to call them Easter eggs you know and you leave these Easter eggs planted in there they're kind of like oh this is kind of hearkening to this song from I Empire or oh, that's cool you know this sound from from there and that was that was my whole thing I mean when we started the Dreamwalker He's sitting there going back to the same synth sounds that he was using, you know, during Love and I Empire. And my whole thing was like, I am going to distort the shit out of that, EQ it completely different, throw whatever you can to make that sound not sound anywhere remotely near what it's supposed to be. And I think that's something else that's kind of like made people think like oh god this stuff sounds crazy and it's like no it's the same pad that was used for you know the adventure but i distorted it put a you know phaser on it (laughs) like whatever whatever it may be just to kind of make it different because you know elon has this philosophy of always not wanting to repeat himself and i'm kind of on that same boat like what's the point of we need a track like The Adventure, and you write the song that sounds like The Adventure, but is not The Adventure, and it always just seems like a, you know, a throwaway, an inferior version of, of what that song is. Why not go out there, write something completely new, use different sounds, and make it sound like it's completely its own thing? And that's something that I have strived for, you know, since my time working with um, Angels, and hopefully it's something that you know, the listeners can hear and say, wow, there really are no two songs on the Dreamwalker that sound alike, or there are no two songs on on the Tom album versus Angels or versus whatever it might be that sound alike. And that's kind of 
where I hope we do go for it. There's going to be hints and some flavors of other stuff, but it, it shouldn't be, you know, the same song written 12 times and let's call it a record. For sure. Yeah. Well, I think we can speak for the whole community when I say we're very, very excited to see what you're cooking up uh, for this next record. And uh, thank you so much for doing this. I mean, it's it's wonderful to hear the ideation and the creativity that goes in behind the scenes and be able to sit down with you for quite some time. I went a little bit over. Thanks for sticking with me no um, and, and, and just getting to hear what it's like. Cause I think the music, the fusion of influences right now is, is really inspired. I think people are connecting with the music more than ever. And, and so I'm, I'm really excited to see where it goes. Me too, because until it's mastered, <laughs> I, you know, it could change. Like it's one of those things where it's like, I've had a song mastered and then we go back and like, actually I shouldn't say until it's mastered, until it's on like um, Apple Music or Spotify or wh- wherever the hell people get music these days, then it's a done deal. But other than that, it could always change and um, that's a good thing, you know, and I'm, I'm proud of that. And Tom always wants to get the best of the best work out there. Sometimes people get it. Sometimes they don't get it. Sometimes at first they're like, oh my God, I don't like this at all. And then listen to it four, five, six times and they're like, oh my God, this is the best record. And I'm like that the same way. Like when Radiohead comes out with their new albums and I think the biggest change would have been like with like King of Limbs, it's like, I first put that on, I was like, oh my God, why? I don't like it. And it's not because it's not good. It just wasn't what I was expecting. So I sit there and, you know, say it's not good. But go into it knowing what you're going to expect after you've heard it, you know, the the first time and you just say, okay, I'm going to drop my guard and go for it. You know, there are four songs on King of Limbs that I think are great songs. And that's not, that's not too bad. So I I say the same thing for Angels fans. Everybody keep their mind open. And like I tell my daughter when she tastes something like brand new that she's never had is don't just spit it out. Try it three more times. And if after three more times you don't like it, then don't eat it. Do the same thing with music. Listen to an album three times. And if you don't like the album after three times then don't listen to it and tell everybody how shitty it is. <laughs> but I just, I just come from a world where I used to go to the music store at the beginning of the month, buy three records, three CDs, and those three CDs would be everything I would listen to for the entire month, whether I liked it or hated it, because I just dropped, you know, 15, 20 bucks on a CD. I better like it because I spent money on it. You know, and these days you don't really have that that monetary hit to you because you, you literally have a billion songs, you know, in, in your pocket and you can just move to the next thing and it's only costing you nine bucks a month. So it's like, yeah, listen to it. Listen to music enough to know whether you like it or hate it is, is um, all I have to ever say. Well, that's great advice. And thank you again so much for doing this. And hopefully... Once the uh, uh, full album comes out at some point next year, uh, we maybe can get to sit down with you again and talk more specifically about that one, too. Absolutely. And you can even cut this interview into two-parter now. I mean, Yeah, no, for sure. It was quite a bit of time. Well, uh, thank you so much, and uh, I guess we'll talk to you soon. All right. Well, thank you so much, Adam.